Good afternoon and welcome. It's great to see everybody on this unreasonably cold November day. My name is Laura Heisler and I am the Director of Programming for the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation. And Laura, along with Discovery for Products, is delighted to bring this Entrepreneur on series to you. Uh, the goal of this series is to connect campus innovators or would-be entrepreneurs with members of the business community and just kind of Entre entre curious community in Madison and bring everyone together, uh, hear from some folks that maybe bring some different perspectives to the Madison environment, have a conversation with some experts who are locally based, and then have a drink afterwards and talk about what we've learned. And so that's what we're going to do today. Um, I do want to mention a couple of other events, a few housekeeping notes for how we'll proceed, and then I'll introduce today's keynote speaker. Uh, so next month, we'll be featuring Thomas K.R. Stovall talking about business alignment for leaders at every level. This will round out our entrepreneurs for the fall semester. Uh, stay tuned for what we're going to bring in the spring. Uh, but if you got an email for today's event, you'll get an email for Thomas's event on December 3rd. If you didn't and would like to be getting emails from us, you can sign up at the table right out front. Uh, where you got your name tag. That name tag, by the way, is your ticket to the reception, so do be sure to have one. We want to be able to talk to each other, know who we are, uh, and see you at the reception. Um, this is also, many of you may know, this is actually Startup UW-Madison Week all week, and so this event is uh, the first one that WARP is bringing for this series. Uh, you can find out much more through the Innovate Network and um, the partner organizations that are listed on this slide, but we also have this great banner to remind us. So feel free to check that out. There are a lot of events all across Madison, all across campus this week. You can find them at innovate.wisp.edu. Other events that work is involved in putting on this week that I'll bring to your attention. Tomorrow in this space, we have a day-long event, which is actually eligible for CLE credits. If anybody's an attorney and wants to knock off 4.5 hours of CLE credit, you can do this at this free event focusing on exploring um, challenges, similarities, differences, and opportunities uh, between the U.S. and China in terms of intellectual property protection and enforcement and creation. And so that'll be right here starting tomorrow morning at 9. Uh, and you're welcome to come to that. And then um, at the end of the week, we at WARP are partnering with Marquette University to bring the third one and a half year, whatever that is, not annual, annual and a half, I'm not sure, uh, Force for Positive Change event, which is an event that focuses on connecting social entrepreneurs in Wisconsin uh, with each other, uh, with some best practices, uh, inspirational stories, resources, learnings, etc. That one's up at Lambeau Field in Green Bay. If you're interested, it's still possible to sign up, and we'll be running a free bus from this building up to Green Bay on Friday morning, if anybody's interested in that. Uh, and so with that, I would like to take just a moment and read a very abbreviated version of Aaron Kennedy's bio. We are so fortunate to have Aaron Kennedy here. We've been running Entrepreneurance for six years, and we've been trying to get Aaron to speak at Entrepreneurance ever since we first started. So I'm excited. I'm a noodles groupie. Uh, uh, Aaron Kennedy earned his bachelor's degree in journalism and English at Augustana College in his home state of Illinois, for which we forgive him because he then came to UW-Madison where he got his MBA. Uh, he went on to do great things prior to starting Noodles & Company, which is what he's perhaps best known for in these parts. He worked at a New York brand design firm where he directed projects on some of the largest and most recognized consumer brands in the world, and I understand he'll be talking about some of these stories today. Brands you've all heard of like Coca-Cola, Burger King, Sears, Swiss Army, The Limited, the Denver Broncos, and the PGA. Prior to that, he was brand manager at Pepsi-Cola and market research manager at Oscar Mayer Foods. Uh, when he concluded his 15 years of building noodles and company as founder, CEO, and chairman in 2008, the company had 170 locations in 15 states. He spent the last 11 years as a board member on a number of companies, many of which you've heard of, like Sartori Cheese here in Wisconsin, as well as the Napa Valley Ventures Association with Wine and Cheese, uh, as well as being a mentor advisor for Colorado business accelerators like Blackstone Entrepreneurs Network, Bloomtown, and Lurch Lane. He also served as chief marketing officer for the state of Colorado from 2012 to 2014. He currently serves on the board of the UW Madison Business School and has been named Entrepreneur of the Year by Ernst & Young, and is a guest lecturer at several universities, including here at UW-Madison. Most recently, he joined Tidal Town Tech in Green Bay as its first entrepreneur in residence. Please join me in welcoming Aaron Kennedy. Thanks, 
a warm reception. I think I am mic'd up here. Can you guys hear me? No? Yeah. So uh, it is startup week in Madison, so when you're building something, sometimes you need a hard hat. So I brought my hard hat from when we uh, did the naming uh, event for the uh, Wisconsin School of Business. I don't know how many of you remember, but uh, Dean Kinnetter pulled off an incredible feat um, back, uh, I don't know, nearly 10 years ago raised uh, well over a hundred million dollars for the naming of Wisconsin School of Business, but instead of having like Anderson School or Watson or, you know, Joe's Business School, they did the uh, Remarkable, which is they had 12 or 13 people that they each contributed roughly 10 million dollars and um, announced the Wisconsin School of Business as it should be. So I thought that was a very Wisconsin thing to do. Uh, but anyway, I brought the hard hat back. I may have to put it back on for the panel discussion. I heard they might be a little abusive. No, I'm just kidding for me. <laughs> I think it's gonna I think it's gonna go fine. Um, let's um, so it is startup week actually all over Wisconsin, I think, is uh, my recollection. Um, there are a lot of communities that are participating in it. Um, I think uh, becoming an, an innovation hub is the main topic here today. So let's just talk about kind of what we're going to do in the next 45 minutes. Uh, I'll take you through a couple of stories about what I think um, being an entrepreneur or a starter um, or a go-getter, uh, what that looks like um, in a couple of different applications. Uh, I think that you can be and you can exercise your entrepreneurial spirit wherever you are. Whether you're working in a big company, or whether you're in a university system, or you're in state government, um, or whether you're actually starting your own company, I think you can uh, develop, strengthen, and hone your entrepreneurial skills. So that's pr primarily what we're going to kind of talk about in the first portion of the discussion here. Um, and then we're going to focus on how to build a brand, um, brand reputation uh, for the state of Wisconsin. How does Wisconsin become known as an innovation hub, right? So that's where we're going to get to uh, in the end. So my background, Laura, did a nice job of sort of summarizing that I was uh, here uh, in the late 80s getting my MBA in brand management before all these beautiful business school buildings were built. Some of you may recall there was the Commerce School. Woo! <laughs> yeah, we were mostly in the basement, if you remember. Uh, there were almost no windows. It was a lot like a prison, but no, we actually learned a lot. Terrific professors, and um, during that time, I worked at Oscar Mayer Food the entire time, and uh, worked in new product development with uh, a couple of remarkable, uh, remarkably talented human beings, um, Bob Drain and Bob Becker, uh, who were instrumental in my professional, well, my personal professional development. Um, I went on to work as the brand manager at Pepsi. Um, went on to found Noodles and Company, and uh, became the uh, Chief Marketing Officer for the State of Colorado to help develop uh, a brand identity for the state. Let's go back to what I just said a couple of minutes ago, which is um, kind of what is an entrepreneur or a starter? Like, what is that all about? And to me, it's about solving the most pressing problems. All right. So, what is if you're starting a business or you're starting an initiative inside a company? You're probably solving a, a pressing problem, right? That's what uh, that's what you're after. Um, so, if you look at Oscar Mayer back in the day, um, Bob Drain solved a billion-dollar problem in the U.S. Not many people get to solve a billion-dollar problem in their life, but Bob Drain did this, along with the team of people that were involved, including myself. Um, he did some consumer research early on and figured um, he was talking to. Uh, working moms and they spoke about with passion and length about the morning crush that nightmarish dash to get breakfast on the table and lunch packed and the kids out the door hopefully some of you can relate to that right so here was a quote it's awful i'm scrambling around my kids are asking me for stuff i'm trying to get myself ready uh you know to go to work um and i, I go to pack these lunches and i don't know what i have right we can probably all relate to that right so bob drain and the team at oscar meyer help solve that big problem. And now it's actually uh, closer to a $1.5 billion brand. We recently introduced and sort of caught on to the idea of doing a natural or organic version of it. It's gone through cycles since the late 80s, um, where part, part of the time I wasn't that proud to be involved in it. Um, you know, pizza and tacos and burgers and stuff that I thought were, that's not Lunchables, that's not what we were after. We were after a quick, nutritious, 
uh, lunch solution for kids. And um, the early ones have these two meats, two, two different crackers and two different cheeses, and Andy's candy, which is a little chocolate mint. You remember, that's a Wisconsin company as well. Um, anyway, um, so we solved the big problem there. And uh, when Pepsi called and said, would you come to uh, New York and uh, be on our brand Pepsi Team? Um, I said goodbye to Oscar Meyer um, shortly after graduating. Um, I had an offer from them as well um, in brand management. Um, in my very first day at Pepsi, myself and the other two members of uh, they were brand new to, to running brand Pepsi. So not Diet Pepsi, not Mountain Dew, not Lipton, not Gatorade. I mean, those other brands, it was brand Pepsi, like the mothership, right? There were three of us, brand new uh, team that was going to be uh, assembled to run this, this product with a $300 million media budget. All right, that was more money than entire Carroll County, the county I lived in. By the way, um, or I mentioned I grew up in Illinois. I grew up in the hills and woods of northwestern Illinois, by the way. Eight miles from a town of 2,000 people. Mount Carroll, Illinois. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Mount Carroll or Stockton. Woo! That's the hill! How about that? Who, who knew? So, uh, that is too far. Um, so, so, it wasn't exactly, I'm not a Chicago kid, you know, I'm not that, that uh, anyway, there are all kinds of expletives going on. I mean, that's not me. Anyway, um, so, the kid from Northwestern Illinois gets a call from Pepsi to come to New York to be a brand manager from the Grand Pepsi team. That was a pretty big deal to me, right? So, first day at the office, I walk in the door. Um, a few hours later, the, the vice president of marketing of, of all the brands at Pepsi pulls our little new brand team into the office. And she says to us, we just started airing the Madonna commercial a couple, oh, like a week ago, a couple of days ago. And uh, there's been a big backlash from some big portion of the US population, or a significant enough portion of the US population that doesn't have, that has religious um, arguments with uh, with Madonna in general, okay? Let's just leave it at that. And our commercial was sort of building off of one of her music videos that was kind of the heart of the problem. So we just spent a million on the commercial. In today's dollars, that's like 10 million. But, um, no, not really. But uh, we just spent a million on the commercial, and we had something like a 30 or $40 million media push behind it. And she said to us, we're going to pull this out, and you have to figure out what to do. So what we did, long and short of it, is that we learned, uh, you can see right here, I kind of say here, that our brand image and sales of her, uh, Pepsi were really being tied to these <coughs> celebrities, historically, Michael Jackson, um, Madonna, and others, right? Well, after a couple of months of work in consumer research, we determined that we're going to build our, rebuild our own brand foundation and define for America what we stand for, separate from being tied to or leaning against celebrity personalities. And um, Coke had just launched New Coke, for those of you who are old enough to remember New Coke. They then had to put the word classic on the old Coke. And then they pulled New Coke off the market, and then all that was left was classic Coke. So we painted them into a box and defined classic as old, tired, sleepy, groggy, right? And, he, and here was, and so that was part of our, what do we stand for? Taste of the new generation, that's us. Coke is tired and sleepy. And here was the first commercial we ran called Shady Acres. Volume, please. Let's go back and... Just step back a second here. We wait till the volume comes up. Rock and roll is okay, but I prefer rap. Hey, dude! Hey, hey! Awesome! This music is good, but nobody can touch Hendrix! Awesome! Well, wait a second. Shady Acres was supposed to get the Coke, and the frat house was supposed to get the Pepsi. Coke, Pepsi, what's the difference? I-24. Moving, grooving, I'm You like slam dancing? Love it! Oh.
This is radical. Exactly. So that was the beginning of, you know, going back to our roots of the new generation. If we could turn the volume up just a little bit more, I'm going to show one more execution because it's so appropriate for this time of year. So this program called the Winter Cool Camps was my baby. I helped lead the national design competition for it and developed all the, the packaging and the advertising program and everything uh, was sort of on my shoulders. And here was what that looked like, a continuation of the strap. Wait, we gotta go back again. Sorry, we need to really get the volume up. Come on, guys! Why is the Polar Bear Club having so much fun this winter? There's no frogs! The water's perfect! <laughs> and what's got them really excited is Pepsi's Winter Cool Collection. Six great designs that celebrate what some people consider the best time of the year. So come on out! need a cooler. Get him now, because I'll be gone with the snow. I love it! <laughs> You'll never need a cooler. That guy was great. So, anyway, great times, um, but we got to keep this thing moving. Um, okay, so solving a big problem. So you don't have to have mine so loud, because I'm already loud, by the way, in terms of the volume on the mic. But, um, okay, so living in New York, but living anywhere in the country in the um, late... Uh, the, the, I'm sorry, the early 90s, your only option if you were in a hurry to get food was McDonald's, Burger King, Taco Bell, Pizza Hut, Kentucky Fried Chicken, right? So, in general, the pace of life had changed through the 80s, right? And everyone was in a hurry. And thus, everyone started eating a lot of fast food. And that is really where you see the spike in the obesity curve in America. So to me, I said, we have to be able to do better than this. We can have high quality food fast. I can't, right? Well, I, uh, well, I started researching, I have, I have a little sort of, you create a vision and you go back and do an assessment. So I started to do some, some research and I, I found the industry people like, no, you're gonna fall on one side or the other of fast and high quality. You're either gonna you know, end up more like fast food, you're gonna end up more like casual dining, sit down slow. And I said, no, 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 uh, you're not listening. I'm gonna do, uh, I'm gonna do high quality food fast. So I created this perceptual map, right? Probably familiar with this concept. I said, what are the most, two, two most salient um, uh, drivers in the restaurant industry? Um, and I thought at that time, time was the new currency. I still think it to be true today. Doesn't matter so much how much it costs in terms of the dollars in your pocket. Um, it's really the speed at which you can get the high quality food. And the entire industry, when I mapped it out on here, was um, on this what I call a value threshold. So fast food, McDonald's, Wendy's, Burger King, all these kinds of places are over here. And as you move closer here, maybe there's Subway kind of in the middle. Um, and then down here, you get to Morton's and you know maybe the fine dining, maybe Cheesecake Factory or something. I'm trying to think of who was around back then. All right, down here. But there was no one in this category right here, right? So in the early 90s, Chipotle, Noodles and Company, Qdoba, Panera, all started uh, to serve the same audience. And three of the four of those were based within about 30 miles of one another in Denver, Boulder. And um, so we started to, to pursue this concept of high quality food fast. I'm only going to have time for a couple of slides here, but since I'm in Madison, right? So, and I spend a lot of time in Wisconsin in general because I have a home in northern Wisconsin. I have for 10 years and uh, uh, a lake house up there. So I'm, I'm already a big proponent of Madison long before that, of course. Um, and uh, you have to have a lot of love in your heart to sign a lease, 10 year lease for a building that looks like that. Um, <laughs> Does anyone know what that building was, what the occupants of that building were, uh, was before us? Yeah. Woo, we got a lot of answers. See, yesterday in Green Bay, there wasn't a soul that knew the answer to that. So it's great. I think I heard like four people say the answer to that. Upstairs, downstairs, Daly was there 18 years. And I thought if we could be there 18 years, that'd be pretty sweet. Well, we've now been there over 20, 24 years. Um, so uh, believe it or not, Middles and Company have been there 24 years. Uh, so the original charm, you can see, had uh, like lots of graffiti and all that sort of thing, and we had to make that into a restaurant. This was the second restaurant. So my good friend, longtime good friend, met him first day of 
orientation in undergrad at Augustana College. Tom Wigan was living in Madison at the time and still lives nearby. And he found this piece of real estate on the corner and called me. Um, we had one fledgling restaurant, it was a country restaurant in Denver. And then this uh, space, he said, this would make an amazing noodles and company. And Tom shared the vision and the enthusiasm for high quality food fast. Let's feed the nation better than they've been fed in the past. Um, and so he and I both got an on the job PhD in entrepreneurship, uh, building out this restaurant. So a lot of stories about how we struggled, but this was certainly one of the most poignant uh, Memories, and I'm not going to take you through the whole story. Some of you have heard this before about being underwater, literally and financially, and uh, in, in, at State Street. But the third week after opening, this article dropped in the Wisconsin State Journal. So noodles and company is a great idea, but the food comes up limp. Ooh. Well, let's read the first paragraph real quick. See what we think of that. If ever there was a killer idea for a fast food chain, a real beat the band, hands down, gold medal, go for the gusto winner. Noodles and Company is it. And I read no further. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. You, you, do have to, you do have to read your criticism. But um, remember, this is before the internet, uh, social media, and Yelp, right? So newspapers carried a tremendous amount of weight with your consumer, right? Um, so our sales plummeted, and I, I won't have time to go through all that whole story, but um, it was... Um, an absolute labor of love. We willed this business to thrive and succeed. And hope, I know some of you here helped us one bowl at a time. So thank you very much. I think Lisa mentioned that she was one of the fans that helped us get through those dark hours in the early days. So thank you. Um, so as you know, Noodles and Company has uh, gone on to survive and, and thrive over the years. And now we have uh, 430 restaurants across 35 states, and so it's basically a national brand, right? Um, retaining the integrity of the food, uh, everything is still sauteed to order, uh, just like you would get in fine dining. Cold ingredients go into a hot saute pan right when you order them. And uh, if you want to hold the spinach and add broccoli, no problem. So it's mass customization. You can get it just like you'd like it. All kinds of good innovations have come since then, including the zucchini noodles and the cauliflower uh, rigatoni. Uh, a lot of great innovation has come uh, in the last couple of years, but I'll always be thankful for our um, years here in Madison and appreciative of those uh, in the community who supported us in the toughest of times. So uh, thank you. Appreciate that. So let's talk real quick about Title Town. So Laura mentioned um, that I'm involved at Title Town. So I'm the entrepreneur in residence at Title Town. So I'm there every other week or every third week, roughly, in Green Bay. Um, and uh, Title Town uh, is, see this is the building, and you may recognize that as Lambeau Field. So we're kind of in the shadow of Lambeau Field. And we were formed out of a partnership between uh, Microsoft and the Green Bay Packers. They, uh, the Packers kind of dreamt this whole idea up of creating an incubator. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about this in a second. But what we do is we build, oops. Back. We, uh, we uh, uh, build and fund early stage high growth businesses. So we create them out of the ground, some, some of them. Some of them we find that are already getting their feet under them, they have a good concept, they're ready to go, and we uh, fund and support them in our office building. Um, and others are businesses we'll just invest in that are already up and running and, and going uh, full steam. The University of Wisconsin system contributed me to the equation. So I am actually an employee of the University of Wisconsin system. Uh, and I work for and place in Title Town Tech. And so that's the contribution the University of Wisconsin right there is making. And 12 Wisconsin companies each contributed a million dollars, each of them. Uh, and so now we have a $25 million fund to invest in those companies in those three different stages. Uh, so, as I mentioned just really quickly, we have an innovation lab, we have a venture studio. So the innovation lab identifies and explores digitally transformative solutions. Uh, we have a venture studio that develops creative market solutions and leverages resources against new and existing startups. And then we have a venture fund, like I said, that we invest in. Um, 
So this fellow right here, you might recognize as Mark Murphy, the uh, CEO of the Packers. And beside him to his right is Brad Smith, who's the president of Microsoft, who was just there in Green Bay three weeks ago at this uh, event where we kicked off and they're in the upper left-hand corner as well. Um, so Microsoft is not just putting money behind this, they're putting resources against it. They have a technologist in residence that they've just uh, relocated from Seattle, their headquarters, to Green Bay. Um, Brad Smith is actually uh, from Appleton, Wisconsin. So uh, he has roots there and cares dearly about this project. And we uh, focus on five verticals, sports, media, and entertainment. So we don't invest in anything. We're not, we, you can't put your head around everything, right? You have to specialize. So we chose ones that were really relevant in Wisconsin in general. Sports, media, and entertainment, digital health, advanced manufacturing, so robotics, that sort of thing. Uh, supply chain, which is already a great strength, especially in the Green Bay area with uh, Schneider International and Breakthrough Fuels and some others. And uh, agriculture, water, and environment, a big priority for us. So, all right, so the heart of this discussion is really about figuring out how to help Wisconsin collectively here and beyond these walls um, become known as an innovation hub. That was kind of the title of the talk today. So I'm going to take you through how we thought about conveying what Colorado stands for to the world. As the chief marketing officer of the state, I was asked, there hadn't been one before me, so I came in and they, they said, this is your task. I'm going to take you through what my task was. But just the basic premise here in Wisconsin and in Colorado is we must, we must define ourselves you know, for the world or someone else or everyone else will. In this age of social media, everybody can tee off and say whatever they think, right? And they can publish. And sometimes they have 50 followers and sometimes they have 50 million followers. So perceptions in people's minds, which we'll end this discussion with at the very end, um, are basically the reality that the world holds for this place. So whether it's Colorado or Wisconsin, the image that people have in their heads of Wisconsin around the nation and around the world are their own perceptions. And many times they're not really accurate or they're certainly not complete. And so we recognize that at, uh, in Colorado and that's what my job was about, figuring out what it is we want to tell the world. I'm going to take you through that. So I have this concept of you're either moving forward or you're, move, or you're getting left behind. That's true in your professional career. It's true in a company, it's true in a city, it's true in a state. Um, so I think. Okay, so you know, some might say, well, Colorado doesn't have any problems to worry about. You know, they don't have these misperceptions. Absolutely they do. We were one of the first two states, right, simultaneously with Washington State to approve marijuana. And so we had gone to pot for this um, heard this headline, right, uh, on television news, and, uh, and uh, you know, it was, it was all over all the television stations. It was the news and the talk of the, the, talk of the news stations for weeks, right? We also had fires, and then we had murders, and we had, you know, just all kinds of problems. Um, when I uh, was one month from starting this job, we had uh, the nation's only, thankfully, um, mass shooting in a the theater, right? one month before I started this job, to help craft and convey to the world what we stand for. Well, we certainly don't stand for that, right? So, uh, you know, it was a steep hill to climb. So when we get to the end and we talk about, I share some of what I think are some of the limiting perceptions, some of the things that may hold Wisconsin back a little bit, don't take offense to it and don't think like, well, I'm, I'm with you, right? I'm a property owner here, I love Wisconsin. I um, graduated from this university. I'm a member of the Weiner Center of, uh, for Entrepreneurship Board of Directors. Um, so, you know, I, I'm committed. So don't take it personally when we get to that. I'm giving you a person <coughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So um, the governor, prior to my arrival, had circled the state and gotten the priorities. So this is like our playbook. What is the governor, the new governor for the state of Colorado, John Hickenlooper, going to do to advance the economy? So he's going to build a business-friendly environment, retain and grow and recruit companies, increase access to capital. But this fourth one, create and market a stronger Colorado brand. He had gone the first year and a half of his administration, and no one had done anything on this. All the other five had been worked on, and they had game plans, and they had commissions and that sort of thing, but they didn't know what to do with this one. Is that type of intentional? Maybe. 
Three. I'm hopeful. <laughs> Maybe not. Oh. Oh, right. To the capital. We got one right down here. No. Um, I should take full credit for that. Um, but uh, it is. It is. <laughs> it is. It was not intentional. Um, so, okay. So, what's our mission? How does that? Um, how does that create and market a stronger Colorado brand translate into a, what are we actually going to do? So we um, took a, a week or two to try to figure out how to convey what we were going to do. Like, what was the whole sphere? And it, this would be true for Wisconsin, too. What's the whole sphere of creating um, uh, a new Wisconsin brand? Uh, what were we trying to accomplish? So to unite state agencies under one umbrella brand and help Colorado become more competitive, um, become more competitive in the global marketplace for talent, trade, and tourism, right? So that kind of covered the whole thing. So we got, we got clear on that after quite a number of conversations. We also recognized that we had a toolbox of, of uh, graphic icons already, right? We had the state flag, which many of you might recognize at the top of this, and we had the state seal. The state flag is very popular. It's used on t-shirts, it's used on marijuana shops, it's used on all kinds of things, right? Um, and so it's not ownable. It's what an attorney would call in the public domain, meaning you can't protect it. You can't keep people from using it. So we really couldn't use it as a state brand, although many people tried to convince us to do that um, in our group. So if you look at state government, this is the just a small smattering of the array of logos being used by the state agencies, right? So if you got a piece of mail from this one with the apple down at the bottom here, and then you got one from this one, you really wouldn't know whether you're getting spam mail or something really from, from the government, right? There was no way to discern. So it was a very weak brand. So we put together a plan a three-step plan to create the brand, implement the brand, and market the brand. In the create the brand part, oops, let's go back for a quick second. All right. In the create the brand part, there are three steps, and I'm going to take you through these right here. We have a discovery step, a strategy step, and a design step. And those are used in every um, rebranding or new brand effort that you ever get involved in. You're always going to have a discovery step, a strategy step, and a design step if you're really doing a thorough process versus sending something out to uh, online to have an array of uh, online graphic designers submit to something, which has no strategy behind it, of course. Um, so anyway, th that's the general process. Um, we were highly inclusive in our approach. Again, if, if Wisconsin embarks on something like this, I would highly recommend it. Um, we did a statewide, what we call tour to corners. Um, tour with our uh, with our brand team, um, and we uh, interviewed 3,500 uh, 3, people, and we did um, we included online uh, access uh, through Facebook and the website. And we governed did television commercials. We have Instagram. We had our own um, website where 600,000 Coloradans participated in the process. We have about the same population as Wisconsin: 5.5 million people, right, roughly. Um, we're growing at about 100,000 a year, so maybe that's about 5.7, 5.8 now, uh, or 5.8 million. So anyway, we had a broad um, effort to include people. So in our discovery stage, um, I wanted to show you just a quick film, a little quick uh, footage, like 60 seconds of footage, to give you a little insight, like a portal, into what we did. So OK, I hear you toured the corners, and you did a bunch of interviews, but here's what that looked like. We're going to need some body. People have just been here for generations. This originally was Mexico. I could uh, predate our existence here in Colorado to uh, 10,000 years ago. Colorado put the wild in west. You know, there's a level of freedom here that a lot of people don't have. So what other, what other threats to the way of life you have here? Non-use of our resources. Regulation. We impose a lot of policy on some of our 
high paying jobs. The biggest thing we fear we have out here, I think, is water. We're dealing with the Colorado River Compact, the water rights. I think water is a huge issue, and I think education is a huge issue. The highly educated people from around the country want to come here. We should be training and educating students to stay in Colorado. We need extreme solutions, but we can have a moderate approach to get there. Rifles still is like a real town, but it's western, it's rural, it's more of a real experience. I'm really into skiing, really into cycling, kayaking, trail running. That's why I live here. Clean mountain air, mountains, uh, rivers, you name it, it's the outdoor mecca. It's not the east coast, everything's so fast paced. Yeah. It's an incredibly diverse community. No matter where you go, it's, it's people helping people. People helping people. Um, which I think that kind of culture, that collaborative nature is, is highly um, valued here in Wisconsin and uh, demonstrated uh, frequently here as well, that last bit. Um, I will say, though, that some of you may think, oh, this was state funded. By the way, I went out and raised uh, capital to fund our entire effort from private companies. Um, this was not a state funded initiative. Could have been, I guess, it could be here. But um, the governor said, he wanted me to do this job, and I agreed to it. And he said, you'll have no, no staff and no budget. <laughs> I was like, can I back out? <laughs> so uh, anyway, he's a, a convincing, compelling dude, so uh, there's no backing out. Um, anyway, so strategy, the second phase, right? So we did um, uh, discovery, and now we jumped into strategy here. And so, oop, I was trying to keep hitting the wrong button. And when I push the back button, it always jumps forward one time. I'm pushing the back button. There we go. Okay. So three elements of strategy is we thought building upon our greatest strength as a state was important, right? Let's acknowledge that and, and define it. Start with something indisputable. When, you, when you're when um, you presenting yourself to someone or when you're presenting your company to someone, it's often best to get them nodding with you, right? So start with something that everyone already agrees about. And then you can introduce something distinctly appealing about your space, right? So this is a very important strategy concept that we deployed, I think, uh, quite effectively. So, but again, you can do it personally, for yourself, for your company, uh, for your family, whatever it might be. Okay, now we're going forward again. So graphic strengths from the state of Colorado, the most recognized icons were the license plate and the, and the flag, right? These are two things that nationally people kind of recognize. And so if we're going to build on those strengths, let's do a little research. So we did a, a survey nationally, um, and we presented the license plate to people and said, what state does this image make you think of? And for the most part, about half, so about half of people picked uh, Colorado. They kind of knew the right answer. <laughs> um, so that was pretty good. And then we did the same thing for our flag, which again, a bunch of people were pushing me. Um, to use as our brand, uh, our state uh, logo. <laughs> so this quieted them down quite a bit. Um, so because a third of people thought it was Chicago, and oh, less than one in five recognized it as Colorado. So, okay, so we have our graphic icon that people recognize, right? Um, what is indisputable about Colorado is that we are king of the mountains. There are 53 14,000 foot peaks in Colorado. And the US entirely only has like 59. So we have like all of them, almost all of them. Um, and Switzerland only has like six, right? 14,000 foot peaks or bigger, right? Now granted, they're starting to lower the elevation. There's that whole argument that I've had before. But um, King of the Mountains seems pretty fair. Um, so that's the indisputable piece. But what is distinctly appealing about Colorado that is the thing we want to share with people that would be most compelling broadly, right? That would cover all those different, you may have noticed in the discovery phase, um, we interviewed conservatives and liberals and uh, people of all different colors and ages and uh, professions. You know, we had just an incredible array of participation in this, right? Um, so what is the one thing that we should tell? I think this is going to play a video. Maybe not. Let's see if I click it one more time. Other airports, you're hearing three or four different languages going. With ours, you, you pretty much hear English. We enjoy uh, eating out late. 
yeah. and the restaurants in Denver close at 10 p.m. We need to make sure that people understand what we do stand for. On the same day, you know, we can, you know, communicate with Europe and also to Japan as well. The non-stop flight. High number of universities. A younger workforce. We think freely, right? And we can be both conservative in some ways and liberal in other ways. It's a state of mind. State of mind. This is taking, like taking a... risk. And so the first step in brand creation is to create what we call the brand position. You'll see Colorado kinship, economic opportunity, independent spirit, powered by nature, and then vitality. It was a tie between Shine Bright and the future is now. Powered by our nature is really the one that's rising to the top for me. It feels like it's leaving out such a big part of the equation. We have wonderful urban things to offer and to present. It's in our nature, feels like Boulder, Shine Strong feels like Denver. So as you saw in there, we defined five pillars, um, vitality, Colorado kinship, economic opportunity, independent spirit, and powered by nature um, as our five core pillars of the brand that we would build upon, right? So in the end, um, that all distilled down into this brand positioning for the entire state that encapsulated everyone, right? For vibrant, success-oriented people who want to live and grow in an inspiring place and be part of an inspired community, Colorado is the state where you can live the life you want, right? So you don't have to sacrifice your professional pursuits for this world-class lifestyle that people know Colorado for. You can have a world-class job as well, right? That might not have been the case 25 years ago or 35 years ago, but it is today. Why? Because it's our nature. And that's a double entendre. That's our natural environment and our people, this collaborative nature, right, that, are, that was encapsulated in some of those qualities I just talked about, right? So then we moved into design, and we did, um, I, I, we, unfortunately, we're kind of running low on time, so I'm just going to have to show you the, quickly the design. We asked Coloradans, tell us or show us what Colorado it means to you. Onward and upward. Timeless. I think it's magnetic. Pioneer the future. Attainable. Inclusive. The notion of that bar is, is to be aspirational. To have a typeface that we can own, that sort of modern West. That was the inspiration for it. It sort of has that nth, you know, mm -hmm. feeling to it. It's sort of indication of progress. It's actually a very compelling combination of, of, I think, two of the biggest brand equities in the state. So now we have scorecards. We've narrowed to two ideas. The first direction is the CEO, and that meaning is cooperation, it's collaboration, it's co-creation. There's this sense of working together. And in this direction, we're taking something very iconic, obviously, about Colorado, the mountains, and using that as the DNA. We'd love to hear thoughts if, they're, if you're leaning strongly one way or the other. We'd love to know because... Yeah. No, I'm not telling you. You're not telling <laughs> So we had a 12-person uh, design team that we picked and picked uh, individuals from all over the state. Again, different ages, genders, backgrounds, but they were all graphic designers, professional graphic designers, and you saw them at, at work there. Um, so we've chosen one of those directions um, to pursue, um, and that direction was the peak, right? Which sort of built out of the state license plate and demonstrates that we're the king of the mountains, right? It also has this forward progress component. We've uh, tested it uh, nationally. Um, again, it outperformed the seed, both of which had Colorado under them, though the seed doesn't show that in here. People aren't that complicated. We want to wake up with a smile. We want every day to feel like an opportunity, to be surrounded by innovation and vitality and beauty, and others that share our vision. Most of all, we want to feel like we're doing what we're meant to be doing, that we are unmistakably excited to be alive. People live here like no place else. In Colorado, people live deliberately. Visitors come from all over the earth to discover our destinations 
and discover something about themselves. People come to start businesses, to learn, to work and play. They come to unearth secrets and share stories. In Colorado, you can live the life you want without compromising personally or professionally. Our state is a breathtaking backdrop where economic opportunities meet a pioneering spirit, where everyone is proud to call this place home. Colorado is where you'll find the most creative, healthiest, and happiest people in the country. Why? It's our nature. Our mountains, rivers, and plains, but also our vibrant optimism and creativity. Whether you're here for a few days or for a lifetime, this state will capture your heart. So together, let's share with the world everything we love about Colorado. That's how we introduce the brand, um, which was really a great joy to finally unveil it to the to the state. And then, uh, of course, the haters came out right away. Tom <laughs> Nanya, as much as that gets your heart, heart well done. And I know the research that was done in Wisconsin uh, and out of Wisconsin by the state of Wisconsin, um, number one and number two place that people want to move from here and from around the nation is Colorado. Uh, I don't know if you saw that 2015 report. So anyway, I only have a couple minutes left, but I'm going to take um, those couple minutes and um, we're going to speed through some of the applications here. And I'm just going to get down to the innovation hub, okay? So we now have a three-thing toolbox. We applied it to all the logo and letterhead. We um, used it across all of our state agencies and trade show booths. We created a Colorado company insignia that went on uh, apparel and uh, boxes and sort of extended our brand into the world. Right? So our companies are, became marketing tools for us, and there are a tremendous number of Wisconsin companies who can do the same kind of thing. Um, not just the cheese companies, which do that already, right? They put the state on there. And so there was a whole array of these, Colorado Design, Colorado Grown, Colorado Made. All, tons of great companies signed up, several thousand of them signed up, and, um, and are using deploying it on the products themselves and through tourism as well. Tourism was a bigger challenge. Um, and if we do take this up here in the state of Wisconsin, um, there would be some good learnings to take away from our uh, challenges with our tourism group. Um, and anyway, so for Colorado, by Colorado, we built this ourselves um, from the ground up. We didn't hire a big international uh, branding agency. We did it from scratch. Um, so let's take just a couple of quick minutes and talk about making Wisconsin an innovation hub, right? Is there a gap between perception nationally and reality? Um, I mentioned a study that was done, um, a survey that was done, national survey to them December, so four years ago, um, in the Wisconsin project. Um, there are limiting perceptions um, that hold Wisconsin back because people don't know the full dimensions. Um, the first two things nationally that came up in the survey, when you think of Wisconsin, what do you think? Cold and cheese. Cheese isn't bad, right? Cheese is tasty, but um, a dairy-driven economy might lead you to believe that there are a lack of uh, um, high-paying jobs, um, a lack of professional opportunities here, um, a divided political environment um, that's somewhat erratic, um, an unhealthy diet maybe, processed food, the highest consumption of processed food, the highest consumption of cheese and dairy, and the highest consumption of brandy in the country. Um, no major metro with cachet, although I would... Uh, I would say that both Milwaukee and Madison have an opportunity to be that. If you look at Nashville, if you look at Boston, and how they redefine what they stand for, Asheville, North Carolina, um, has created cachet. Um, anyway, a number of others on here. Um, but let's look at the reality of Wisconsin. So Wisconsin on its best day. So when I showed you the brand video for Colorado, that was Colorado on its best day, right? You know, the skiing and the... Um, tubing down the river and all that kind of stuff. So what is Wisconsin on its best day, right? It's this absolutely stunningly beautiful nature, which the National Survey did turn up. It's a highly industrious people, a history of industrious people. I think incredibly strong uh, companies have been built in this state and are built in this state uh, every day, but people don't really know they're from here. Um, vibrant small towns. Uh, Wisconsin has some of the strongest small town America that I've seen. I see the rotting core of small towns in Illinois and in Iowa and um, across other parts of the country. 
But that's not the case here. Small towns do much better. Um, a vibrant startup scene with lots of activity happening, both at the university and in nodes like Town Tech and others around, around the state in all uh, walks of life. Um, it's a very low cost of living and it's very inexpensive to start your business here. Um, that, I think, could be one of our big draws and is one of the ones we're using at Town Tech. A high quality education system all the way through, from you know primary all the way through graduate school. Sports and recreation abound. That was something that turned up in the national survey. People really recognize it. Thank goodness for our strong sports team. Can you imagine if we were North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Wyoming? They have no sports, right? They don't even they don't even come onto the radar for people um, at all, right? Low crime, it's a safe place, and friendly, playful people. This is the reality I know, and I'm sure there are many other dimensions that we could add to this list, but there's only so much room on the page, right? So with that, I would like to bring up the panelists and our moderator, Aaron Oliver, to take over from here. But thank you for your attention. Hopefully there was some good takeaways for you. Frozen cheese reminded me of how I, when I was walking this morning into the uh, uh, next Lambo there at Titletown, that's how it felt. It was like six degrees, but it felt like two, it said. This is November. I don't know if anybody knows it's not January, actually. <laughs> Well, thank you, Aaron, so much for that great presentation. Uh, my name is Aaron Alder. I'm the director of University Research Park. We are a nonprofit that's affiliated with the University of Wisconsin Madison, and our mission is to create space where entrepreneurs and innovation can flourish. So we're known for the million square feet of real estate that we manage. Uh, and one of the things that makes it exciting for me is, as a relatively new director, I've been there five years now, is that Research Park is both stable, we've been around for 35 years and we make a profit that we donate back to the University of Wisconsin each year, but we're also in the process of innovating ourselves and trying to reinvent the suburban office park so that we can serve the needs of entrepreneurs and innovators into tomorrow. So this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Um, I wanted to start off just by letting each person on the panel here introduce themselves and give you about one minute on their background and the organization that they represent. And I'll, we will skip Aaron because he's he's introduced himself at length. And we'll start with Lisa. Well, I'm from Mount Carroll, Illinois, and you guys have no clue that for Northwestern Illinois, there's nothing in Northwestern Illinois. I graduated yeah. in a class of 56 people, right? For you, unbelievable that you're from that area. Yeah. Uh, you guys have no idea. I mean, that's really, that's not cool. But anyway, there we go. There's my one minute, right? <laughs> we left and now there's virtually no one there. No, no one's there. I mean, and you're right. There's really dying towns in Illinois. So uh, anyway, Lisa Johnson, I'm with now with BioForward uh, Wisconsin. We are a member-driven organization uh, representing what I call the biohealth industry. Of course, you guys think of life sciences or biosciences. Uh, I try to use a broader term because our members also are in the healthcare systems or our members, medical devices, digital health. Um, and so uh, my role in this whole area is, I'm just gonna lay it out. I'm not the innovator, right? Uh, I'm, I'm a doer, I'm just a doer. And I think that's part of innovation is you need both. You need to have, I've worked with brilliant scientists. I've been part of two startups. I've been there, I've done it, it's tough. Um, you kill yourself, it's the greatest experience ever. Um, but I worked with the brilliant scientists that brought out the innovation, the products, the services, and it, or created them, and I helped do it. I helped bring those to market, right? And you need both to be successful, um, to have a startup um, and have an innovation economy um, or a, an area like we have here in Madison. So anyway, with BioForward, what we're trying to do now, um, swinging out of, of being in private industry and now I went through government and now into a nonprofit, um, we really are trying to have programs and initiatives that help support grow our industry and that includes young companies um, working with our research institutions and really but you can tell I also have a loud voice. I, I'm a megaphone. I really want to tell the world what's happening here and to take action to do that and not just talk about it. So if that was more than one minute. So if you're a megaphone, then I'm worried for y'all. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. My name is Elmer. That's enough. Uh, and I am the executive director of 
Scale Up Milwaukee, which is an initiative of the Greater Milwaukee Committee. Um, and I am loud and intrusive and invasive and uh, obnoxious about one thing. And that one thing is, what is it, Harry? Grow your business. Grow your business. Uh, I plan to bet. Um, <laughs> uh, we care about growth because we understand that when companies grow, good things happen. So we believe that we are really uh, well into the work of transforming the culture of growth in the region. Uh, we do this in a couple of ways. We have a membership program with events and opportunities for people to come together to learn how to grow their businesses. And we run two accelerators, one called Spark, which is focused on businesses with revenues around 100,000 up to around <laughs> a million, uh, owned by people of color and women, and another called the Growth Accelerator which is for businesses with revenues around a million, up to around 15 million. Uh, and we are obsessive about helping companies grow and about changing that aspiration and that ambition to grow. So we've had about 152 companies go through our accelerators. Uh, they have about 400 million in revenue. And in the last couple of years, they've created about 1,000 jobs. Um, and I'll stop now. Oh, I always have to make sure people know I am not from here. I've been in, in Wisconsin for about six years. I am from the East Coast, uh, and I wear that tag of being pretentious, and obnoxious, and pushy with pride because I'm putting it for good use in, in a, a phenomenal state like Wisconsin. That's a good follow-up. I also am not from Wisconsin, and in, we're talking about branding and messaging. I think a lot of graduate students will share that story that they came here and then somehow Wisconsin kept them, and that's what it did to me. And I also convinced my entire family to move here, except for my brother. I haven't gotten him yet, but I will eventually. So there is something special about what Wisconsin does. Uh, hopefully that can be captured. So. My name's Idella. I work with the program that is part of the University of Wisconsin system called the Center for Technology Commercialization. Um, I guess our main element is to help companies be competitive for the $3.7 billion federal program that is the SBIR, Small Business Innovation Research Program. But within that, we've developed a lot of programs, um, many coming on board in 2013 when I came on, uh, on staff, many because of Lisa Johnson here at the end of the table. So, uh, you can thank Lisa for programs like the IT Advanced Seed Fund and the SBIR Advanced Program. But through the uh, mechanisms of these competitive grant funding opportunities, we developed some robust curriculum that help reduce the risk in competing for these kinds of uh, com you know, competitive opportunities, but also kind of reduce the risk for those who are new to the entrepreneurial process, those who are new to the grantsmanship process. It's my personal passion that entrepreneurship really is a gateway, it's a skill that everybody needs to get. Um, and it's also a, a continuous learning school, skill. So even if you are an entrepreneur, there are definitely new things that you can learn about being a better entrepreneur to grow your business. So we develop programming and communication that not only helps those who are new to the process, but hopefully also helps those who are um, who are existing businesses but want to go into some new markets. And that's the other area that I've become very passionate about. I think this world of SBIR, I know we're going to talk about this later, has been kind of focused on that technology, but something that was said earlier is that innovation is about um, solving pressing problems. Innovation does not necessarily mean technology. So one of the things I really want to try and get across is that there are so many innovative ideas that are funded through the SBIR program that aren't necessarily in the traditional idea of technology. My favorite is the fish farming guy, I want to share that. So we have a, a client who got some USDA funding. He says walleye, um, being able to better farm walleye is an important thing, it could be a good economic driver, but it turns out walleye are cannibalistic. So how do you improve a farming system for walleye so that you can uh, produce more wildlife, feed our existing fisheries, um, produce more wildlife for people to buy and eat? That is a question that was funded by uh, SBIR. So I want more people to be able to take advantage of this robust program. Thanks, Idella. So our topic today is Wisconsin is an innovation hub, and there's really sort of two parts to that if you, topic if you think about it. One part is how do we project 
the innovation that's going on in Wisconsin. That's sort of the brand question that Aaron was introducing. But of course, for your brand to be authentic, it has to have proof points. So we also want to talk about the underlying innovation sector itself and what we can do to make Wisconsin uh, more robust so that we have more to brand and more to sell. So I'm sort of curious to start by just letting the panel react to Aaron. What did you hear that caught your ear? Um, did you expand your to-do list or did you find anything alarming? So so my favorite thing, uh, two of them, uh, then the haters come out. <laughs> I think that was actually a really important moment. Uh, one of the things that we don't acknowledge enough is, frankly, when we start to make progress, when we identify something that's scary because it's too ambitious, the haters are gonna come out. And there's an opportunity for us to shift our culture to say, when the haters come out, we must be on the right track. Uh, that kind of resistance is one that, like drag, like aerodynamic drag, increases the faster we go. Um, the other thing is, and I, I could not uh, stress this more. Uh, Aaron talked about leveraging the region's growth, or excuse me, leveraging the region's strengths. Um, we have to be really careful. There's no version of us uh, being a not very good example of someplace else. We should always aspire to be the best version of Wisconsin. And so in the example of, of Colorado, let's not try to become uh, an oceanside state with great, you know, yachting and uh, preppy clothes. Let's be a state that's really good at the things we do, whether that means water technology, whether that's biotechnology, whether that is manufacturing and so on. Um, I really love the idea of leveraging the region's strengths. Could I just play off of that? Because we talk on the phone, we want to make sure we have the little argument. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Right. Okay, so I agree on a point, but I had this down, but I took it a little differently, and I don't know if you guys feel this way, is that I, I agree on the strengths, but I think um, this whole idea we've got to continue to be this dare, you know, and I know you said we don't want to just be the dairy state, but, you know, people see the strengths of we're this manufacturing state. Let's really play off of that, and let's play off for agri you know, agricultural state. And you're seeing it correctly. We have strength in water. We have strength in the biotech. We do have strength in egg. And I don't mean to be cutting egg because I do think it's important, especially as we're going forward. No question, water. Extremely important. I think those are things we can play off. But again, it's this whole idea of, well, let's go back to our roots, what we're about. You know, I'm so tired of hearing that we're the industrial Midwest. I mean, the politicians even are like proud of that. Um, and so, and I, but that's a strength, right? Well, let's stop it. That is not, can we get rid of that old way of thinking? Because the bad thing when we keep bringing that out, I'm not kidding you, Rachel Maddow, AP, uh, CBS, known as the Rust Belt woman, I, I am constantly writing people, criticizing our media, who continue to define who we are. And again, I realize that's not strength, I'm going off a little bit, but it, it's this, when we talk about being kind of these manufacturers, and that's what I'm afraid that people continue to go back to our strengths, then we don't have opportunities to redefine who we are. And I really want this state for us to start really latching on about that where people want to be a part of this state with the biotechnology or biohealth, with the water, with ways that we're doing some innovative things in agriculture. Let's spin this on its head, but this old way of thinking, well, what are our true strengths? My God, this state's dying. We aren't gonna have any young people here anymore. So I think we gotta really turn that up, and I just don't wanna be just always talking about our strengths, because I think people do go back to the old way of thinking about who we, like the origins of where we are today, and that, I think that is really hurtful for us going forward. So. I, just to kind of add on to that, I, what struck me was the idea of communication and being intentional in what that communication was. And you laid out a very clear strategy on how you kind of change what that branding is. And as a scientist, I mean, the whole branding world is not in my wheelhouse of expertise, but we can all serve to be better communicators. And so I feel like what you guys have said is other people have defined us. And we've not taken the time to communicate who we are and really shape that, be, take control of shaping what that conversation is. Right. I mean, the fact that 
Elmer is here from the East Coast and has stayed here, and it wasn't. The fact that I have transported my entire family from, from the South up to the frigid cold. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's something that is attractive about that, the state, and it's not being captured in, in our collective communication. And then also there's power in what we all do individually for businesses at all stages. And there's just not a good, robust articulation of what that is. The best we've come up with is at least identifying, oh, you're the SBIR people, you're the vote people. But that's not even good. So we're just really not very good. We don't have the resources yet, but we've just not been very good at We're getting better. Yeah, yeah. commandeering, commandeering the communication. But I thought it was interesting. I, 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 when you first started, you went, now don't take it personally. And I thought that was really interesting because I, I, I worked for a company, Merck KGA, bought my company, and they would criticize us in Wisconsin. Like, you guys are so sensitive. My God, just get on with it, right? So it's interesting, though, you kind of were, you had to pick up on that because we we are a sensitive lot, and we have to quit being sensitive. It's a little bit like yours. We have to quit being so sensitive and being, start being more aggressive, right? <laughs> well, I think. Being sensitive actually was a driver. Um, is it? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a, it's a strong driver. Uh, but again, it's all how you channel it. You know, how you channel that energy if you got if you're feeling defensive. So you know, one of the things that has to happen for any good strategy is you have to build on your strengths. And part of what I'm sort of hearing here is saying that some of our traditional strengths might not be what we want to put forward today. So. You know, Elmer, I know that you are working with a lot of growth companies. You have kind of a powerful model for trying to unlock growth. What are some of the strengths that are emerging, especially in Milwaukee, that people might not be aware of? And how are you trying to unlock those? Yeah, so so I wanna I wanna make sure that we are using language the same way. I think Lisa, you make a great point. Um, I'm terrible at sports, but I'm gonna try to be a sports metaphor. Um, <laughs> you know, I imagine there's soccer players out there who uh, are really great kickers, except they're not great soccer players. And so they are discovered by the football team. And then all of a sudden they're playing high school or college football, but all they do is kick, right? So if when talking to that soccer player in high school, we thought of their, that person's strength as soccer, we'd get it wrong. Their, their strength is swinging their leg really hard. And that could result in, I'm gonna ask you a question, I promise. Uh, that could result in uh, them playing the NFL as a kicker, or they could become uh, a rocket and move to New York City and can can. And I know that sounds totally crazy, but I think that's the opportunity we have for understanding how to reassess what our actual strengths are, and not just say, "Well, we we have cows, so we're good at dairy, so let's do dairy." Uh, I think it's so. When I think about what makes uh, our model really impactful is uh, we, uh, this model was designed by a guy who's not from here. Uh, it's the first North American deployment of this strategy, literally a guy named Dan Eisenberg wrote a book, and we started doing it in Milwaukee. And every interaction was in fact an intervention. So we are sensitive to the words that people use, for instance. We are not excited about the companies and our accelerators calling themselves small businesses. So when you say, hey, what are you doing? It's not a small business owner. No, 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 you're a growing business owner. Uh, we are uh, really interested in thinking about both the technical aptitude of these operators, but also the way they think of themselves as responsible for growing businesses. Uh, we look at things like the change from the beginning to the end of their program in their projections. And the change in the projections symbolizes two things. One, did they learn something? And are they more confident in their ability to execute on what they learned through the business? Also, the belief that growth is important and the change in their, uh, frankly, their ambition. So what we have really focused on, and we do a lot of technical things, is uh, those things that you whisper in ears. Uh, it's the subtle choices you make uh, in the way you present information. It's what you choose not to say, it's what you, what you will actually stop a conversation to course correct about. Um, it's being very clear about what our desired objectives are. Um, it's, it's nuance and subtlety, but with a hammer. <laughs> I love it. 
You know, Adela, um, you, were, you mentioned earlier that not all growth comes from technology companies. I actually think Noodles is sort of an interesting example of this. This is a hugely rapid growth company that if it was headquartered here, we would love to have all those corporate employees and, and home office employees here. Um, so, you know, how do we go about um, thinking about this problem of, of finding growth in more places where people don't necessarily think about it and, and who's out there doing that work? Yeah, so the, I said at the beginning that that all technology isn't always going to be great. And I think, so towards the question of finding growth, we I think spend a lot of energy trying to nurture innovation from really cool technologies. And we think that that's always going to work, and we think that's going to work a majority of the time because they have millions of dollars of research behind them, maybe they have some IP, and um, you know, that it just makes natural sense. Why wouldn't it always work? And so I think I would like to see us try and change our conversation and change our use of the words. First, I, I would like us not to continuously interchange technology with innovation because we then move out of the conversation companies like Noodles, companies like the fish farming guy. Uh, I saw on an SBIR or a topic, uh, I saw an SBIR awardee, um, they had a, a manufacturing product for chickpeas, so like, I don't exactly know all the ins and outs of it, but basically like making chickpeas better in the snackified world. I saw another NSF funded project for a better shopping algorithm. Like that. But it did. So there was innovation in that. And so I think if first words matter and trying not to exclude people from the conversation by, by using words in a way that might be restrictive and not inclusive, I think is, is one area. Um, I mentioned, you know, uh, having, so who's allowed to be an innovator? I'd love to be able to see more people come into the conversation. A lot of what I, uh, I, I, I know from my own experience as a graduate student, I, our, our class was about half mixed, male to female. But I would not say that the kind of IP is half mixed. I would not say the kind of entrepreneurs that I see come into SBIR is half male, female, right? So there's definitely something that could be changed to bring more women, professionals, underrepresented persons into that conversation. And the last thing I guess I would say is that the sexiness of startups seems to be, and all of the resources, seems to be restricted to those who are new teams in the entrepreneurial space. But it leaves out existing companies that could, as you're saying, um, reach. <laughs> add strengths. And innovation and disciplined innovation is a strength. Being able to create milestones that build upon each other towards growth is a strength. And we don't often create that space and those resources for existing businesses, which, by the way, is my plug, because SBIR is fund companies that are 500 employees or less. That's a lot of people. That's a, that's a lot of businesses that get left out of that big chunk of money and opportunity. So, so you know, I'm a former management consultant, so of course, anytime anyone has a matrix, I am in heaven. So for me, the matrix that Aaron had was sort of the, the killer chart in there showing that was kind of the innovation. That was the innovative insight that found at Noodles was it's not the app. I don't even, I'd be curious to know how the app is going um, that Noodles rolled out. But, but the innovation was finding that new quadrant in the chart. And it kind of shows you that you can innovate even in the restaurant industry. And I'm curious, another, another form of bringing um, non-traditional innovators into the conversation is, is spreading it beyond Madison, beyond Milwaukee, to rural parts. I'm kind of curious to hear where you're seeing innovation, and particularly with Title Town Tech and in non-traditional industries. Well, I think in general, um, you know, the urban areas, so Madison, Milwaukee, have um, the critical mass to support uh, entrepreneurs and startup, uh, the startup economy uh, to a far greater degree. But, you know, Appleton, Wausau, La Crosse, Bush um, Green Bay, um, these cities um, have uh, the talent 
have enough uh, critical mass to support um, an incubator or an accelerator, or in our case, um, a uh, venture studio that supports and advances businesses. So I think um, you look at why would, in Green Bay's case, we have the Packers that are going to, they believe they're going to benefit from advancing the entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem in Green Bay. They think that it'll be easier to attract and retain talent, both players and uh, professional staff, if it's a vibrant city, right? It's very simple. You know, nobody wants to go to the end of the earth. And I was told uh, just yesterday uh, by an old timer in Green Bay that um, Green Bay used to be the NFL joke, like you'd get sent to Green Bay if you weren't going to, <laughs> like it's giving such a time out, you know? Um, but, uh, you know, they, they changed that. Reggie White and some other uh, pros came to Green Bay uh, on their own accord, um, chose to go there. So, but the same thing, we need to have not just professional athletes choosing to go to these towns, but we need to have professionals choosing to go live in these towns, whether it's for the quality of life that they get, the cost of living there, the inexpensive cost of um, starting a company there, or and hopefully the big hug that they get in the community help advance, start and support and advance their company that they're going to start. Nobody hugs like Wisconsin. <laughs> uh, I want to go out to the audience and see if there are questions that you have. I mean that we're warm and friendly. I was yeah, all in it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think Wisconsin's, oh, okay. Wisconsin's got great leadership. I mean, UW-Madison leads in Fortune 500 CEOs. And if you look at it, that uh, I have, you know, the presidential cabinets on a per capita basis, we probably have more presidential cabinet uh, secretaries coming from Wisconsin than any other state on a per capita basis. I'll, I'll bet you anything if you look at it in detail because they just they just end up there all the time. So we lead in leadership. We lead in leadership. And another thing. Uh, we do lead in, we are a manufacturing state, we lead in equipment manufacturing. So we're the manufacturer's manufacturer. We provide the equipment. Uh, and, and that's really, that's kind of our small state quality too. You know, there's like this vibrant small towns and so forth. Equipment, you know, John Deere or something like that, you know, tractors. There's all uh, 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 lawnmowers, whatever. There's all kinds of equipment. Uh, I think those are strengths we need to look at. Reactions? I didn't hear a question in there, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dan. Okay. What about your? Yeah. Um... Being a geographer, uh, I was interested in the presentation on Colorado, which I thought was very well done. Uh, one thing that I've heard many times is that Colorado is often considered to be not one, but three states because of differences in topography, economy, culture, ethnic makeup. There's the eastern half of Colorado, which is part of the Great Plains, and you have the northwest, which is a part of the Rockies, and then the Southwest, which has a fairly strong uh, Hispanic culture. And uh, my question is this, did you take any of those dividing factors into consideration when you did your uh, project of promotion of Colorado, emphasizing any of those regional differences? And then, of course, I think the same thing can also be said in Wisconsin, where you have the dichotomy of the southern half of the state with Milwaukee and Madison as big cities, and then the northern half of the state with fewer cities and primarily forests and agriculture. So I'm just thinking those are differences that need to be taken into consideration when you're looking at a state. Thank you. Thank, thank you for that question. So we really focused on finding the unifying threads that tied all Coloradans together. What was the belief system that no matter where you lived or what your political views might be or uh, what your age might be, um, you know, that, what are, what are the foundation? What's the foundation that we all stand united on? And those are those five pillars. 
Um, Colorado kinship, which is that collaborative nature, the vitality, take two steps at a time, you know, fit and active and go get them like that one guy I talked about um, in the video. But uh, we also recognize the dimension of our state the, um, uh, was, a, was a positive. Um, so, because most people don't want to move to a place that's homogenized, that's homogenous, like just one race or one uh, belief system. They like a dichotomy of views and perspectives. So we didn't um, ignore that. Um, but the tougher challenge was to find the threads that united everyone. Um, and that's what we really focused on. You know, one of the um, things that I think is really interesting about the collision between geography and innovation is that innovation tends to scale with increasing returns to density. There's great research out of the Santa Fe Institute about this. And what happens is when you cluster more and more people into a relatively dense area, you actually get more innovation per capita. So, you know, I'm building a whole strategy at the research park trying to make 250 acres literally more innovative. But you see this when you look at the data. So, um, the top quartile of cities in the country are 20 times larger than the smallest quartile of cities in the country, but they're 45 times more innovative because of the scaling effect. So one of the challenges in Wisconsin is our population is spread out. We're not all clustered in the Denver metro region or the Minneapolis-St. Paul metro region. And so we have to find strategies like finding pockets of growth, inviting a, a more inclusive entrepreneurial economy, finding ways to um, push innovation into tr traditional fields like manufacturing. Lisa's doing really interesting work to kind of unite the manufacturing side of biohealth and reposition and re-energize that sector. So we have to find these strategies to really punch above our weight. Uh, thank you, a very uh, good panel and talk. A uh, question on uh, the change management aspect of this, because as you said, the haters came out and Well, I would probably point to the governor and the chief of staff, Roxanne White, um, as being the, um, the strong arm in the room, you know, to just drive this process forward. You have to have somebody that's incredibly forceful and influential um, to keep momentum going uh, against resistance to change. So in our case, that would be the governor and uh, the chief of staff. The challenge with having the governor do it is that governor is coming from one party, and the, as soon as the next governor gets in there, they're probably going to change it. So that is some of the learning. Like, how do you create a sustainable brand in Wisconsin that will survive um, the administration changes, regardless of party, honestly? Um, so, uh, but that was the approach we took. But you need a strong leader here, somebody that everyone respects. So maybe it's like a former um, leader in the state uh, takes up the flag for this and uh, helps uh, bring in industry and bring in tourism and uh, bring in the military, you know, whatever sectors are, are really important here. Military is important to us. I mentioned it could go to the Air Force Academy and, and other bases. But, um, so, but I think we need somebody to carry that flag. It would be great if it wasn't the governor. And I do think WDC, I mean, you had mentioned that in our call, uh, Aaron, I think in the questions where the state itself has tried to do some of this branding, you know, WDC has done the in Wisconsin, they did go through some branding efforts to try and define, but I think not necessarily the same way as you did, Aaron, in Colorado, but there is the branding out there by WDC within Wisconsin, um, and I think there's ways that we just have to play off. I just don't know, you know, my point, and I sound all negative before, and I'm extremely positive on this state. I think it is all about change, though, and trying to still send that message of how we have to change people's perceptions out there. And I don't think just the in Wisconsin is going to do it, right? That branding, because they don't know what that means. They don't know the power we have in a lot of our industries. And, and that's what we are trying to do with the biohealth industry is really getting out national campaigns to talk about the breadth of companies that we do have here. That if you come and have a job here, 
Um, if you were working at Paul Ransford's Blue Gen and hey, you know, I've working for Paul, hey, there's like hundreds of other companies to go work for, right? But if that perception no, isn't out there. That, no. no, everyone wants to work for Paul, so. But anyway, it, especially because you know, he gets to do it at research department. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But I think it will be hard, just as a state, though, to go through to get will that ever happen again? Because WDC actually went through some. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. But I do think there's different other kinds of brandings by industries that we have to get out there and start to change this perception because we know we're in desperate need with our industry for talent. Um, so. What I would say, though, which is contrast to what I would say about startup environments, I think having a lot of like generator, having a lot of different um, startup uh, movement around the state that comes from different places is great. However, if we're talking about branding, having lots of different messages coming from different industries is a disaster, I think, uh, because you're diluting uh, the impact of one unified voice. You really need to get everybody on the same page. It's a big project. I don't know whether we can do it here or not. But if you get industry, uh, so part of the momentum that we have is that we got you know 20 big companies, 30 big companies to put money into this initiative. They had skin in the game, right? They wanted this to succeed, and they embraced it and uh, put it on their products. Um, as soon as we got the badge, you know, that said Colorado made or Colorado company. Um, so it, I think for it to have it just in general branding, you need one clear message that you deliver to people from every avenue that they hear about your company from. It has to look and feel the same from no matter where it's coming from. That's a powerful brand. So you haven't seen like that in Wisconsin. Have you looked at that at all? I don't know if you have it. Because I'd be curious what your opinion would be. I mean, that would be. Don't answer that. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I mean, because there was that branding. I, mean, I don't know how many years ago, but there was a branding exercise that, I mean, so it would be interesting so, to say, have you look at that. I, Let's get your I opinion will. On. I, I will. Since we're from the same old town, we just do it over secret. <laughs> we want to get a couple more questions in, and in a few minutes, we're going to go to a reception. So I'd invite you all to stay and keep mingling with the panel. But I, I saw a couple more questions out here, so go here first. Marijuana laws are changing in so many states. They have Colorado, they will soon in Illinois. And I'm wondering, is there a way of integrating challenging situations into one's brand? I mean, not so far as maybe is saying, we do marijuana right, or we don't have to <laughs> But again, a way to make sure that people know we're realistic about our brands, whatever challenges we're facing. And marijuana might be a good example. So can I, can I just, I'm, I'm not going to use any of the words you use, but I just want to say, uh, we are realistic about our brands. That was a very Wisconsin statement. It was a, it was a, right? It was like, well, we don't want people to think that we are, right? You, it, the act of, uh, the act of cultivating and, and creating a brand is aspirational. You know, we get to uh, describe who we are by what we want to be. And uh, so, without answering your question at all, I'll say, you know, there's some fantastic room to uh, help the rest of the country if not the world, understand who Wisconsin is by being aspirational. Maybe one more question? Over here. What's that? OK, the mic has been given. Um, this has been really nice, thanks to the panelists, but a little bit of reality. Since we're on that um, slide there. All those are really nice points, and they're all positive points. But we have some stars in this city in the state that are not up there to deal with branding. Uh, we have the lowest gap between achievements between black and white students. We have the lowest gap in unemployment between black and white unemployment, um, not just here in Madison, but across the state. Uh, the rural counties are probably our poorest, some of the poorest in the country. So these are all things that you can't just put your head in sand and say, hey, you know, we're the great, all these great perceptions when there's other limiting perceptions that are out there. So the question is, is that how do you go about putting those in this equation and then coming out with a branding that everybody is, like you said, is going to take hold of and acknowledge and embrace? Thank you for that great question. So I think one of the things that we had to come to terms with 
is that the opportunity to shift to an innovation hub, if that is the decision, right? If that is the decision for the state. It is not meant to be a uh, an explanation, a real time depiction of who we are today. Um, we're selling. The, the truth of it is, we're selling. Coca Cola doesn't describe itself as sugar water. It doesn't. It doesn't sell itself as future diabetes. It says we are. We are delicious. We are refreshing. We are togetherness. And so I think. Uh, I think we have to make sure to. Uh, assertively distinguish the conversations about how we will sell ourselves to ourselves and the rest of the globe and how we will come to terms with where we are. They're two different conversations. Um, we can't sell what is entirely disconnected from our, our present tense. We can't say, oh, by the way, yeah, we already have uh, an incredible network of flying cars that are autonomous, by the way. We have to ground it in where we are, but we don't have to uh, sell the fact that we are the most incarcerated state in the country for African American men. We don't have to, I don't have to, when I'm out selling, I don't happen to mention that. Uh, so that's, that would be my approach. And it's, and I'm gonna say this, the guy that moved here from New York, it's not dishonest to not air all of our dirty laundry all the time. We can be proud and honest at the same time. I want to build on that by saying that I think, you know, obviously creating a unified brand is not going to solve every issue in the state, but it can help if it helps the state prosper, if it helps the entire state have a better um, sort of uh, image in people's mind around the nation, around the world, that attracts people uh, like yourself to move here. Um, I guess all of us moved here. Um, the, uh, it, um, it will provide the resources to solve some of the problems, like the gentleman mentioned. Um, if that is a priority of the political environment, that's really a political problem, maybe not as much a brand problem, but the brand can help, again, improve the economic uh, vitality of the place, which in turn provides some resources that we can employ to solve some of those issues. I just want to put a point, if we are going to be an innovation hub, we also have to be innovation doers. So it gets back to a point that, that we have resources that should be available for everybody. And how do we bring more people into the conversation? Because if you are in those rural areas and you see the power of thinking entrepreneurially or expanding what entrepreneurship means to you or connecting with somebody in a different area or region of the state because we are those connectors, that I think will change perceptions and that will add trustworthiness to the brand. I want to thank you for that question because I feel like it's the perfect uh, question to close on because we can all go debate that uh, over drinks and snacks which are being served right outside there. Will you join me in thanking the panel?